Online Church, Pastor Ed Newton from our main campus here in San Antonio, Texas. And wherever you're watching from, know that we are honored and blessed by the fact that you are logged in and linked in to what God's been doing, a part of this movement. We continue on in our series entitled Passion and Pursuit. We are tackling a particular issue that is no stranger. That is, in our culture, there is a prevalent reality, and that is depression. And we want to be a church that puts this on the forefront to help people understand that in the midst of your depression, there's hope. There's a God that doesn't just say move on, but instead moves in. And that's our prayer for you. And whatever you're facing, whatever you're dealing with, I hope this message encourages you for you to know that you're not alone. And there's a God that's defeated sin, death, and hell and come back from the dead and nothing is impossible. So if you're contemplating and struggling with suicide, please understand this number that's on the screen, we ask that you would call immediately, seek help, get counsel. That number will be available there on the screen and please make that effort to call because we want you to know that your life truly does matter. Also, if you're saying, I just need some extra resources in regards to encouragement, please understand that this email address that we're giving you is simply for that. It's nextsteps at communitybible.com or you can visit us online at communitybible.com backslash next steps. You can share your prayer request. We'll definitely and most likely let you know in that email response that you're not alone. We're praying for you, believing alongside of you. So let us know how God speaks to you during this message. And once more, know that you matter and your life is worth living because there's a God that's come back from the dead who gives eternal life and forgiveness and there's hope in his name. Until we meet again, much love. I wanna speak to the issue of depression. 16 million people battle this unfortunate reality of depression. If there was a room where we just had 200 people, now there's more than that in this gathering today, but 200 people, just to give handles to the reality of how many people battle depression, which by the way, second most diagnosed reality in the medical field behind, behind cardiovascular disease would be depression. If there's a room of 200 people, 50 people are battling depression. 30 would be on antidepressants. And I wanna just from the onset say this to you. We're not going to be a church that seeks just to dodge the issue. We're gonna speak to the issue and we're not gonna be flippant or trite in our verbiage and just go, move on. But instead, we're gonna say there's a God that desires to move in. Are y'all with me today? A God that wants to move in to the, the levels of depression to begin to help you know that there's confidence in his word. He has not left you nor forsaken you. You're not a second class citizen in the kingdom of God, that you are his son and daughter and he'll never give up on you. And today in your struggle, there's a God that wants you to know he's good. And this is a confession from a fellow struggler that I received, a young lady that just said this, I begin to thank God every day for my depression. Listen to this. I begin to thank God every day for my depression because every day in the struggle, I realize that only God could satisfy me. Amen. He's the only one that could satisfy me. How about this testimony? I began to stop praying, God, make me feel good. And this was her confession. May I realize that you are good. And as you and I begin to learn what it means to be sensitive to the conversation concerning depression, which is prevalent in this room. I've seen it all weekend where people just went, thank you so much for being a church that's willing to address it, not to sidestep it, not skirt around it, but to address it head on to say there's hope for those that feel hopeless. So if you have a Bible, 1 Samuel chapter 22, we've been talking about the life of David all summer. If you're new to CBC, we go through character studies in the Bible. David is what we're working through this summer. Every summer we do a character study. And as we talk about David, Yes, he was the people's champ, the overnight sensation, defeating Goliath. And what we know to be true is that he had a friend that was knit to him, known as Jonathan. Now David finds himself, 1 Samuel chapter 22, you'll read this, he's in the cave known as Adullam. Now watch this, 1 Samuel chapter 22, the Bible says, David departed from there. Now if you're with me right now, say Amen. Where did he come from? We, we just jumped into verse one. He departed from there. You know where he was at? The very place called Gath. For some of you, you go, that's familiar. Gath is the capital city of the Philistines. And where was Goliath from? The Philistines. So why is David coming from Gath? 
His life begins to unravel at the seams and everybody has turned against him. And I'll speak more to this in just a moment. He was so low in his life. He thought the only place that I could find comfort would be with my enemies. And he goes to the city gates and literally the Bible would say this, that he was drooling off his beard and he was scratching on the city walls. They would say he was a madman. And in the midst of that, he finds finds no comfort, and now he ends up in a cave called Adullam. And watch this. David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's house heard it, how did he get this low? When they heard it, they went down there to him. If depression can be described by any sentence in the Bible, that is, they went down there to him. A deep, dark place. But the cave of Adullam literally translates sealed off place. It was so dark, but yet at the same time it was down into a cave David finds himself. But it's interesting in verse 2, and everyone, watch this, all the misfits of society start coming to David. Verse 2, and everyone who was in distress, everyone who was in debt, Everyone who was bitter in soul or discontented gathered to him, and he became commander over them. And 1 Chronicles chapter 11 would say, and they would become mighty men of valor. Watch this. We serve a God that takes broken pieces, makes masterpieces, takes people that nobody wants, and turns them into people that everybody wants. And I'm just saying to you that we serve a God that gets into the cave with you and hope begins to rise. Do it again, God, and that is do the miraculous. Now, all week long, I've been thinking about the fellow struggler. And I'm making this confession to you. I'm not a poet. I try to be. I listen to hip-hop music. That's a true statement. (laughs) So I rap a lot in my car. I have a journal where I write down. I'm trying to write songs and poems. And I wrote a poem for the fellow struggler. I'm not good at this, so I put it in print for 15,000 people to read it with me, right? (laughs) Now, listen to me. This I wrote in reference to studying this passage. It's in the target section. You'll see it at the very top. Because David was in the cave of Adullam, and the word Adullam means sealed off. But God gave me a word. Oh, somebody hear me. God gave me a word that we have a God who's familiar with the cave. Now listen, there's a cave of depression that is inevitable for all, where darkness abounds and the walls are so tall. You sit in the shadows of sorrow with no hope for tomorrow, but there is a light in the distance drawing near with persistence, bringing comfort in pain. He, Jesus, is familiar with the darkness of the cave. Oh, listen to it, church. For there once his body was laid, but on the third day he was raised to give you a promise that this giant you face has already been slain. That's the promise of God for you. Jesus, placed in a cave with a stone that was sealed, but on the third day came back from the dead out of a cave so that you and I would realize that we have a God that doesn't just say, move on. He moves in so that you could recognize that there's an all-sufficient Savior who is sovereign and in control of all the details of your life to help you overcome your depression. We got to talk about it today. We have to talk about it today. And I just need us today to begin to process along with the notes because I've tried with the very best intentions to articulate a succinct message that would allow us to have handles on this particular struggle. Point number one, write this down, defining depression. Defining depression. Now, as we define depression, there's letter A, letter B, there's a confession and also a clarification, a confession, a great definition by a preacher that I love who's in heaven today would say this, a feeling of helplessness and hopelessness that leads to sadness. Helplessness 
in hopelessness that leads to sadness. Now look to the clarification, letter B. A sense of personal powerlessness and a loss of meaning in life and enthusiasm for life. Those symptoms, sadness, hopelessness, failure, guilt, punishment, self-blame, loss of interest, interest, indifference, worthlessness, fatigue, lack of sex drive. I mean, we could go on and on and on and on. And in the midst of this, as we talk about the symptoms, we have to understand the only way that I can articulate this, and it's interesting how things work, where God allows me to get these tangible lessons from life to communicate in such a way that maybe somebody goes, that's exactly how to define depression. For example, all week long, I've been typing on my computer, but I've been having a struggle. That is, my space bar has been jammed all week long, which means as I'm typing, thumb down, space bar, it doesn't work. And so I have to literally keep pressing. And as I would, as I'm typing, not looking at the screen because I haven't mastered how to type yet, but in the midst of that, I'm space bar, I'm like beating on the space bar. And then I look up on the screen and this whole paragraph I've been trying to type is all one long run on sentence. No space between the words. Maybe that's helping somebody define depression that you have all these words and all these emotions and feelings that just seem to just be connected and there's no space and it makes no sense even to you. And our life just feels like one long run-on sentence with no punctuation, no period, and it's like, God, I I can't even express how I feel. And that's what makes defining depression so difficult is because we don't know how to define it. But could we just look at it from the perspective of there's a lot of words there with no spaces, no punctuation, and it's there, but I I don't know how to put this into a sentence. So defining depression is difficult, but may we understand it's in these three categories under point or letter B. And let me just walk through this real quickly and carefully. It could be a storm. Have you ever heard somebody go, how was your day? And your response was depressing. (laughs) So what does that mean? Today was depressing. It's a storm that blows in, blows out. How about this one? How was your week? It's been a depressing week. That's not just a storm. That's what I call, and meteorologists will call this a squall. That is that storm begins to build and it does not move. It just builds and builds and builds. And so we find ourselves battling depression, not just because of one moment, but now it's a series of moments. But how about this one? Many of you find yourself in a season of depression, and it's been years. It's years. And that is, we understand that's the struggle. Not just the situation, but it's a struggle and the sorrow. And for many of you that are looking at me right now going, okay, the burning question in my soul is, Ed, do you battle depression? And there's been bouts in my life. I Honestly, as I begin to articulate this message, do you know nothing in me wants to stand in front of 15,000 people and go, yeah, There are moments I do. As the preacher, you're supposed to be the bionic believer. Like the super saint. Able to jump from one tall building to the next and the cape is flying like, I don't struggle. But you're looking at someone who does. As a matter of fact, before I became pastor of this church, there was a season in my life where I faced, I would call the squall for three days. I sat in a chair and did not move. Did not bathe, did not comb my hair, didn't brush my teeth. And my wife's looking at me going, help me understand. And I couldn't articulate it. Was it circumstantial? Possibly. Was it clinical? Possibly. But in the midst of it all, I cannot fully express to you the shame I felt like I'm not supposed to be dealing with this. But then I began to realize as I read through the Psalms, David wrote 75 of 150 of the Psalms. And the common theme in all of it, depression. Which means we're in good company. Job, my redeemer lives. Do you know he was battling depression? Jonah, underneath a juniper tree, going, God, kill me. And God begins to send him shade. Elijah, Elijah, once more, God, kill me. God sends him a servant with bread and water, the proverbial Chick-fil-A on a Sunday when it was closed. It was miraculous. It just showed up. Just showed up. 
Like, here's some nuggets and waffle fries with Polynesian sauce. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Like, <laughs> rise up. So in that moment, we recognize that we're not alone. So we look to the pages of Scripture and go, fellow strugglers. So as we define depression, we now got to go to deciphering depression. Deciphering depression. Even though letter A and letter B sound so simple, it's yet so complicated. There's a clinical aspect to depression, and there's a circumstantial aspect to depression. Can I talk about the clinical for a second? There are hormones in the body that secrete particular chemicals that balance out for us, creating stability in our mood. Serotonin, dopamine, norepinephrine. I had to really work hard on that last word, norepinephrine. (laughs) Those three chemicals, if there's any imbalance, affects how we feel. So for us as the church, could we just be a church that goes, we will not look down on anybody that has to take medication to balance out those chemicals. We won't look down on anybody. Because we will embrace the fact that God invented medicine as a remedy of a healing agent, which means that if you're battling depression, please hear my voice. It's important that you consult a medical professional to figure out the chemical imbalance. Meanwhile, choose not to do that alone because in finding the right medication, and some of you know what I'm talking about, very unlikely they're going to get the right medication the first time, which means it's going to be a journey, and you cannot do that alone. And so through the process of genetic, hereditary, passing on, there is a clinical reality where someone begins to look through their family tree and go, they battled depression, they battled depression, they battled depression, this makes sense, which means there's hope for you, not that misery loves company, but you need to know that there's hope for you, that the church will not look at the issue of depression and go, it's a faith issue. Lord, help us. Like, I will jump off the top rope with an atomic elbow on somebody's head (laughs) if they look at somebody and go, just read your Bible more. Pray more. It's a faith issue. It's a sin issue. I I will drop my elbow on top of you in a hurry. Don't ever say that to somebody. That's like looking at somebody that's been shot and go, stop bleeding. (laughs) And sometimes in religion, what we do is we try to put band-aids on bullet wounds and that's not who we are at CBC. That's not who we are. We will address that there are legitimate biological imbalances that need to be consulted by a medical professional, which means, can I just speak this into somebody's life? That moment where you take your medication and you have to go take that privately because you're ashamed of that? Not here. Don't you ever be ashamed of that. It's just the reality of what's going on. God's still good. He gave you the medicine to balance that out. If God chooses to deliver you from that, then he'll deliver you from that. But don't you ever walk in shame as you consistently have to take that medication. There's a circumstantial reality of that. Yeah, I'll create some space for you to clap. I'm sorry. I'm just, I'm, I'm trying to get us to 12 o'clock, so thank you. I'll try to create some more space. I, I'm just really passionate about helping people understand that sometimes the church hasn't handled this well. But there's a circumstantial reality. A person can only handle so many circumstances that just feel so defeating. I don't have time to go into this, but David, the eighth son, you got to hear the first message of this series, the eighth son, which means when the prophet came, when the prophet came to anoint the next king, seven sons, Jesse just brought seven. All of a sudden, Samuel goes, uh, Jesse, don't you have another son? Oh, yeah, he's just in the field as if to say he's just a shepherd. So he realized there's some daddy issues with David. Fast forward, you'll find out like once more, he delivers the Lunchables to his brothers in the Valley of Elah in the battle. And all of a sudden his brother Eliab begins to criticize David when he's delivering food. Then we find out, remember we talked about this, you keep your friends close and your enemies what? Closer. Saul doesn't let David go home. So all of a sudden now he's in an unfamiliar atmosphere and context. He gets married. He gets the the king's daughter by defeating Goliath. Watch this. Saul attempts to kill David, 
But that plot gets to his wife, David's wife. And David's wife says, my father's going to kill you. You need to flee. So David flees. Saul goes to his daughter and goes, you tipped David? His wife, David's wife goes, he was going to kill me too. So I had to. She sells out her own husband. You you think that marriage is going to work? So all of a sudden, David, so when we go, how did he end up in the land of the Philistines? Now does it make a little bit more sense? He had nobody. Nobody. Jonathan would eventually find him. But now we look at 400 misfits that society had deemed as misfits. And God goes, no, no, they're not misfits. They're miraculous movements of my sovereign power in their life. And I will use them to come alongside of David and defeat multiple giants in the land. David would become king. And these brothers that were with him in the cave, it was like ride or die. We're together to the end. And they, cut, they go from the outhouse to the penthouse. That's how that works in their life. And they, they get a Beyonce upgrade. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. They get an upgrade in their life. But they were in debt, discontented, in distress, and God begins to do a work. And so as we talk about the circumstantial and the clinical, sometimes it's both. Real quickly, can I show you this picture from Van Gogh? Just real quickly. Many of you have seen this particular portrait painting called Starry Night. If you've seen this before, would you raise your hand? I mean, it's famous. We've all seen this. But did you know that Van Gogh was, as some would say, was a Christian? Did you know also that Van Gogh battled depression? And do you know that this painting is actually, he's looking out of the insane asylum. Which, by the way, isn't it interesting how we use colors to describe feelings? That's why the sermon title is Beyond Blue. What's the, the common denominator in colors? It's blue, is it not? There's shades of blue, which is a symptom that Van Gogh struggled with, depression. But do you see the yellow? The yellow, as you begin to look at the pattern of Van Gogh's paintings, always signifies the love of God. Sun, moon, stars, God, you're good. It's above the depression. But watch how this begins to be told in Van Gogh's painting. Look down into the village What's the tallest building in the village? It's the church. Do you see yellow in the church? No. You know what Van Gogh's saying? Grew up in a Christian home, battled depression, but I couldn't find answers in the church. So why would I take a moment to speak to the issue of depression? Because we're gonna have a church, come on, with some yellow. Y'all with me? With some yellow with some yellow. We're going to address it. We're going to speak to it. And as we talk about overcoming depression, now we get to point number three, defeating depression. Defeating depression. The traditional response in reference to the church are some statements that have been given to me by our counseling team. We have a full-blown counseling center here at our church, which, by the way, is for free. So when you give to a church, you're not just giving to a church, you're giving through a church, which, by the way, our counseling and support center that we have that's officed here on the third floor of the education building and multiple volunteers, thousands of people, we're top five in the country in care, support, and counseling. Here's the reason why. We don't want to just speak to issues. We want to go, hey, listen, we got what you need here. Not saying that we don't refer, but what we're saying is this, is that We want to walk with you through this, which many of them that lead the support groups are fellow strugglers that have come out on the other side of this going, you know what? God allowed me to go through the valley of the shadow of death and I'm gonna march back into the valley of the shadow of death and I'm going after my fellow strugglers going, there's hope for you. There's hope for you. And so defeating depression (laughs) is by putting together An understanding that it's not the traditional responses that are superficial and symptomatic, such as topical. Once more, not trying to put band-aids on bullet wounds, but instead by the neosporin of the Holy Spirit. Are you with me? The neosporin of the Holy Spirit. We get to the root of the issue, which means it's going to get messy and at times be painful. But we link arms together. And so we look at a tactical response, not a behavior modification, not try better, do harder, but you and I begin to embrace a tactical response, which means life transformation. And so underneath letter B are a couple subpoints. May you and I recognize, here it is, 
what God begins to do as we look at a tactical, tactical response, life transformation, reject isolation. Why would we create space to talk about this today? Because there's somebody in the room that goes, I felt like I was all alone. You're not alone. All of us. How about we do this? The first time, I mean, I've preached so many services right now, I can't remember what I've said and what I haven't said. But let me just say this. I just need to prove and validate that at some point all of us have faced a level of depression. If you have, would you just raise your hand? So can we just put to rest the thought that you are alone? Because you're not alone. I mean, our hands were raised. We've all battled that at some point. We will face moments of depression. Some are in the season of depression. It's been years. It's maybe even months. You're not alone. We reject isolation. But subpoint number two under letter B, we see we receive the invitation. God sent a friend who can reinforce, that can reinforce, reject isolation. That is, we have people that can relate. So when you and I raised our hand at that moment, I know that seemed insignificant, but there were some in this room that just went, oh God, thank you. Because the enemy told me I was all alone. You're not all alone. You're sitting next to the fellow struggler that's in the journey with you. But then we recognize, yes, and we receive this reinforcement in Zimbabwe right now. This is phenomenal to me. There is such a stigma attached to mental health, especially depression. And so they've been trying to promote, please, because suicide rate is off the charts, please see a psychologist, a psychiatrist, see a counselor. But there's a stigma attached to depression. And so they recognized that the population was not going to go to the counseling center. Hello, novel idea. The counseling center goes to the people. How did they do that? They began to establish in local parks in Zimbabwe what's called the friendship bench so anybody that's battling depression, they could go sit on a bench and that person that's sitting there, it's been designated and deemed as the friendship bench, which means don't sit on that unless you need somebody to talk to concerning depression. And so there's counselors that are sitting around the clock just waiting for somebody to sit down. We're going to be a church that operates in everything that we do with a friendship bench. Come, sit, you're not alone. Receive the invitation, reject isolation, but last but not, not least, recognize the impossible. That as we serve a God where impossible does not exist, as we go back to the fact that Jesus Christ came back from the dead, is there anything too hard for him? The answer to that is no. Therefore, we believe in faith that Jesus could deliver you from your depression. But if he chooses to allow you to walk in this, understand he does not let you walk alone. But for some reason, he wants you to find victory personally in him, though your feelings are telling you something different. You're walking through depression, and as you recognize Christ is all that you need, it begins to reverb in the lives of people such a message of hope. But let me see if I could just somehow bring this to a close. 2015, Hollywood put a film out that was unheard of, especially in the genre of kids. It was a film called Inside Out. How many of you have actually seen that movie? Would you raise your hand? Now, this was interesting for filmmakers. Here's the reason why. Because many would say, you cannot talk about depression in family, especially in the lives of kids. But if you've seen the movie Inside Out, it's actually a very beautiful portrayal of what's going on in the mind of a little girl named Riley, who's 11 years old, that lives in Minnesota and is a tomboy and loves playing hockey. And she's fun and rambunctious. And all of a sudden at the table, mom and dad say, we're moving to San Francisco. And now we get the inside out of five particular emotions that are characters, our personalities. And the whole movie is the inside out perspective of the emotion of a little girl that begins to battle depression. And those five emotions are anger, fear, disgust, sadness, and joy. Now you have to understand what's happening is, is they are in an all out approach of restoring 
happiness in the life of Riley. But as these memories, these good memories that allowed her to walk in stability and security as a young child, all of a sudden the depression of what she's facing is removing these memories. Riley has an imaginary friend, and I love the name of this imaginary friend. His name is Bing Bong. Not Ping Pong, Bing Bong. Bing Bong. And he's an elephant. And he sings songs with Riley. And Riley's happy and she's bubbly and she's singing songs, talking to her imaginary friend. And all of a sudden she gets the news and all of this begins to fade. All the memories that we see in this in the cerebral cortex of her mind, like all of a sudden these orbs of these memories are beginning to dissolve and they're crumbling and they're falling apart. But it comes down to the last good memory. And joy, who is the leader in the mind that's going, we can do this, we can do this. Joy ends up in depression. And she's in the pit with the imaginary friend named Bing Bong who's beginning to disappear because this core memory is beginning to fade because depression is taking over and it's a last chance effort to get joy out of the pit of depression. But watch how sacrifice made it all happen. Turn your eyes to the screen, check this out. As I was watching that clip, I, I just, how joy ends up in depression. But through the sacrifice of one, a friend, joy gets out of depression. As you and I think about this message today, it's because Jesus gets in the pit with us, gets in the cave of Adullam, sealed off. And it's his promise, it's the rainbow, it's the promise that he has come back from the dead. Oh, he's not disappearing. Job said it right, right, my redeemer lives. And because he lives, I can face tomorrow. And I don't know what tomorrow holds, but I know the one who holds tomorrow. And I will wake up today and I will take another step and listen to me. There's so many of you in this room that you walk in this place and you go, I don't feel like I'm singing the right way. But I'd be honest with you, I don't even feel like singing. And I don't lift my hands and I don't come to an altar, but your act of worship is you're here. You're here. And every day you're taking that step. And I want you to know God smiles on you right now. God smiles. Nothing in you feels like singing, but you're fighting for joy. But you're here and God goes, I'm so proud of you. We're going to do this together. You're not alone. So with heads bowed, eyes closed for just a brief moment, we we have to begin with Jesus being in your heart. And if you've not put your faith and trust in Jesus today, we invite you to call on his name. Let him move out of heaven into the crazy and into the chaotic of your life and let him change you from the inside out. If you've never done that before today, we invite you to call on his name. If that's your prayer, just say this to him. Lord Jesus, I'm not perfect, but I believe in you. I give you my life. Now, for those of you that prayed that prayer in faith, it's not the words that save you, it's your heart. But if you prayed that prayer in faith, would you just raise your hand right where you're seated, right where you're standing? How many of you would just go, yes, today? I received that. Thank you, ma'am, in the mezzanine. Thank you, sir. Anybody else today? That would just be honest, hands all over the place. Thank you for your courage. I'm just looking around to see if there's anybody that would just go, yes, that's me. Welcome to the family of God. It's the greatest decision of your life. And we just want to clap our hands and celebrate for you. Amen. We're so proud of you. 